Who would you pick? If I were to ask you, who's the greatest person in the Bible other than Jesus? You can't pick Jesus, you can't pick the Holy Spirit, you can't pick God. So who is the greatest person in the Bible? Is your mind starting to go a little bit? Maybe you'd start with Abraham. Abraham, that, that, that guy that was at the very beginning, the, the, the promise, the covenant of God, that he would make a great nation, Israel, out of one man. Many, many of the religions today trace their roots back to Abraham. Uh, just think about that, all the, all the foundations of all forms of Christianity and Catholicism and Judaism all go back to Abraham. Even the Muslim religion traces its roots back to Abraham. That would be a great call for, for being the greatest. How about Moses? That, that guy that, that led his people, an entire nation, out of captivity. Set them up in a country of their own with laws of their own. The guy that wrote the first five books of the Old Testament. That would be a really good choice, wouldn't it? Maybe, maybe a guy like Daniel. The guy that had an influence over three separate kingdoms. He, he influenced the Hebrew and the Jewish people in amazing ways. But he was also second in command of the Babylonian Empire and the, the Persian kingdom. He was an advisor to kings and, and he changed the trajectory of their life and their ruling. Maybe you would choose Esther, the queen that saved her people from genocide. That was amazing. We may not have the Jewish people today if it wasn't for Esther. Or maybe, maybe what Ruth did as, 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 let me get this right, great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus. Maybe you'd choose Mary herself. Or, or maybe, maybe Joseph or, or Jacob. The, the list could just go on and on and on, right? I mean, who's the greatest? Who's the greatest person in the Bible? Well, the good news this morning is we don't have to argue about it because the Bible clearly states who the greatest person is. It's so just one verse. I want you to see it. You don't have to flip to it. I'm going to put the words up here on the screen. Just one verse, and, it, and it's in red letters. And that means Jesus said it. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, Jesus says, Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist? What? John the Baptist? Jesus says, look, of all the men, all the women, everyone born of a woman, there's everyone that's ever walked the face of the earth. Let me tell you, there's, there's no one greater than John the Baptist? <laughs> Did, did he even make your list? He, he didn't even make my top ten. The guy that lives out in the desert, the guy that wears camel fur and a, and a leather belt, the guy that eats locusts, that John? Yeah, he's the one. The guy that shunned the spotlight, the guy that, that stayed away from the mainstream and, and the big stage and the big cities. That's the greatest? Well, it's in your Bible and... And it's in red letters, so you can't argue. And here's the other thing that blows my mind. Because in verse 11, Jesus goes on to say this. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now remember, if you didn't join us last week, we talked about the kingdom of heaven. And it's anywhere that the king is ruling and reigning. And that's why Jesus would walk the earth and he would say the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is near. You must have, you only have to, to repent and believe because the moment you step by faith into Jesus, God begins ruling and reigning in your life. And you are a part of the kingdom of God. So do you see what John is saying? Out of all the people ever born of a woman, and that pretty much is going to be all of us, the greatest is John the Baptist. Yet, anyone who becomes a Christian, even the least of you who think, hey, I'm not a very good Christian, even you are greater than him. 
And I'm like, how is that even possible? It goes because John the Baptist lived and died before the new covenant. Before Jesus' death and resurrection, John the Baptist lived and died, sold out for God, making him the greatest at that time. But now you and I live in a time where the Holy Spirit is in us. And that makes us even greater than John. So today we take a, a dive into this thing called greatness. Today, we're simply looking at how do I find our purpose? How, how do we find our purpose, our significance, our worth? And my bet is that many of us are, are chasing significance. Many of us are chasing success. Many of us are chasing a form of greatness. But how do you define it? And once again, we're, have to, we're going to see how Jesus defines it, but we're, we're going to have to be confronted with a question. Is he God or isn't he? Because if he's God, if he's truly the Lord of my life, then he is what I pursue. Not myself, not my agendas. I pursue after him. So let's see how he defines our life and greatness. And let's see if we want to match up under his authority or if we want to be Lord of our own lives. This is going to be a fun one. You ready? Open your Bible. Turn with me to John chapter 3. And we're going to be picking this up in verse 22. John chapter 3, verse 22. Now remember, John's writing this book saying, I know that, that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are out there. They talked about what Jesus did. But John wants to tell us who Jesus was. And then you also need to keep in your memory banks last week because the most religious man in the world, in the nation at that time, a man named Nicodemus had come to Jesus at night. And before he even gets his question out of his mouth, Jesus says, you got to be born again. And we talked about that last week. And we looked at this famous verse that everybody knows, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And just a few verses after that one, we get into this. John chapter 3. Verse 22, after this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptized. You see, this is, this is where John the Baptist is hanging out, out in the Judean desert, the wilderness, the countryside. So after Jesus was in Jerusalem, and, and after he flipped over the tables in the temple, and after he, Jesus sat with the most religious man in the nation and told him he's not saved unless he's born again, now Jesus is going to go out into the area where John the Baptist is. And he's going to open up shop right across the street from John. People, listen, it's good to have a temple or a church. It's good to go to a place and worship God and be religious. It's great that we have a Sunday service. But what happens when Jesus invades you? What happens when Jesus goes, hey, thanks for giving me your Sunday mornings. But now I want your Monday through Saturday as well. Because that's exactly what's going to happen to John and his guys. And there's going to be some, there's going to be some friction that we're going to be able to see in this passage and it involves whether or not we think we have a territory. See, John's, John's followers are like, this wilderness, this, this countryside, this is our territory. This is our turf. And John is going to show us what true greatness is when he says, well, you've got to see this. At the end of it, though, I promise you, you're going to be left in your chair, and you're going to be asking yourself, am I giving Jesus my religion? Or am I giving him my life? Do I really see my life as his? And once again, we're going to have to confront that question. Is he the Lord or isn't he? Jesus moves into John's territory. Watch what happens, starting in verse 23. Now John was also baptizing at Anon near Salim because there was plenty of water, and people were coming and being baptized. Now, this was before John was put into prison. 
an argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came and to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he's baptizing and everyone's going to him. And just like that, we have a problem that comes on the scene. So let's break it down. How do we defeat jealousy and pride? Because that's what's coming up here. My jealousy, my pride, my life, my stuff. And if it's something I'm supposed to hold on to, then it's about me. Do the things that we possess create this pride, this jealousy, this, this, this competition in me? Is my life something that I can freely give away? Because if it is, then there's no pride or jealousy involved. But if not, well, John's disciples come to him and say, boss, we got a problem. And you can write it down on your note sheet this way. With success, there will come criticism and competition. With any level of success, there is bound to come criticism and competition at any level. Your child, your grandchild wins a second grade spelling contest. I promise you there's going to be drama in the second grade classroom. There's going to be jealousy. There's going to be competition. There's going to be criticism. It's inevitable with almost any element of success. Your kid goes five for five in a little league baseball game. Guess what? The parents of the other kid who went 0 for 5 are going to be saying, you know, if our team had your coach, if our team had the kind of money that you guys spent on training and equipment, my goodness, with any element of success, we're going to have this level of, of criticism and competition. John the Baptist is out in the wilderness baptizing people, and an argument breaks out. The, the Bible doesn't even tell us exactly what it is, and I love that. Because if the Bible told us exactly what the problem was, what the details were, were, then we go, oh, well, that's the issue. But God goes, you know what? I'm not going to give you the issue. I'm going to show you the problem. And the problem is, get ready for it, folks. The problem is pride. We've seen it in all stages, all areas of our life, haven't we? John's disciples were like, hey, we're being criticized. Really? About what? Well, we're well, about our baptism and something to do with ceremonial washing. We have no idea what the issue is. But it could have been over a thousand different things. The, the Pharisees were, were phenomenal about taking a simple process, ceremonial cleansing, and turning it into a complete science. They had pages and pages of instructions on how it's done, why it's done, how it's not done, why it should be done. There's water in baptism, of course, but, you know, baptism is primarily for the Gentiles because they're unclean, they're less than worthy. But if they're baptized a certain way, they can now come into the Jewish faith. Like, how long do you hold a person under? There's a law for that. What if, you, what if you dunk them down and the water doesn't completely cover their head and they don't get completely wet? There's a law for that. Oh my gosh, we have criticism for everything within the body of Christ. And Jesus, Jesus says, the, well, let me hold on to that thought for a minute. The Bible tells us that something happened and we don't know exactly what. It just says something has risen up from a certain Jew doesn't even tell us who was involved. But it has to do with the ceremonial cleansing, the way they're doing their, their cleansing and their baptisms. Oh, and by the way, by the way, Jesus has just set up camp across the street. And a lot of the people that used to be coming to us, well, they're now going to him. And we have this competition going on. Remember when everybody used to come out from the cities and they would come and we would baptize them here. And they would hear your message, John, and, and you would baptize them. You're, but now, now everyone's coming from the cities and, and they're turning left before they get here and they're going to see Jesus. 
And we got nobody here, and he's full over there. You know what? We need to make our baptisms bigger and better. We need, we need a band to put up on the stage, and let's put up a video. Let's, let's get some really cool baptism. Maybe we could start drive through baptism service. That would be awesome, wouldn't it? Better yet. How about this? A water slide baptism. I love it. And we would serve donuts. Of course, they would have to be Dunkin' Donuts. You knew that was coming. <laughs> and the competition develops, which brings us to number two on your note sheet. Nothing reveals our character more than when ours is attacked. It's a line that a pastor once told me, and, and it stuck with me, especially this past week. Because I remember it hit me on Tuesday evening during my sermon prep. Man, this is so true. Nothing reveals our true character more than when our character is attacked. When someone attacks me for what I'm doing, when someone goes after me, someone wrongs me, someone makes up the, these malicious stories about me, I'm like, what? Where did that even come from? Man, it's no wonder people are upset. Why didn't they just ask me if it was even remotely true? Well, we heard it from her, and she heard it from somebody else who heard it from somebody else, so we're pretty sure it's true. Man, we've all been there, haven't we? When someone is slandering you, when someone's attacking you, man, nothing reveals our true character more than when ours is being attacked or when someone gets a piece of something that we think is ours. How many times have you been passed over for a promotion? How many times have you been skipped over on something you thought was rightfully yours? How many times has someone else gotten that job that you wanted? Someone else got the platform, someone else got the applause, and, and darn it, it should have been yours. How many times has someone else jumped into your territory and you feel like you've lost a chunk of your turf? People, nothing shows our true character. Nothing shows who we are inside more than when our character is attacked. And people, let me tell you from this past week, for me, it is a matter of pride. It is. I had someone this week make some very unfortunate accusations about me that I felt were completely untrue and unfair. And I spent a good portion of this week really, really ticked off, stewing over it, becoming angry over it, because I felt, darn it, I was right. I was, there was an injustice against me. But people, you have to understand this. I plan out my preaching schedules weeks, sometimes months in advance. But in all things, I pray that God will use this platform and use me how he wants to use it. And I promise you this, when I planned this series and today's message, I had no idea that it was going to hit so close to home for me personally. Pride is the root of so much of our conflict and our sin issues. So much of our downfall comes from pride. So I had to wrestle with this idea this week. How do we take on humility to become great? And how far should we go in defending our character when it's attacked? And I love the way Chuck Swindoll put it in this, his book called Living Insights, the book of John. It's got a great paragraph on humility that I, I'm like, this is so good. I'm not, I'm not even going to try to paraphrase it. I want to read it to you word for word. By the way, I, I, I put these messages together. And, and i got to be honest with you, I'm not all that smart. But I go to some really, really good sources. And Chuck Swindoll, I've been a fan of his for probably 30, 35, maybe even 40 years now, in the Insight for Living Ministries. Amazing man. And I also review the commentaries from a guy named David Guzik, who has a free online resource at EnduringWord.com. It's an incredible commentary on the entire books of the Bible, all of them. And the best part is it's all available for free online, EnduringWord.com. He does this amazing, brilliant research, and then he writes his commentary at, at like a fifth grade level so a guy like me can understand it. So in each of my messages, I have a lot of friends that I bring to the table and, I, and, and a lot of ideas that I, I can go through and weed through and, and, and 
people that help me understand this stuff because I don't get it on my own sometimes. So here's what Chuck Swindoll writes. Genuine humility calls attention to Christ, not itself. You see, there's a sad misconception among Christians that genuine humility stems from feelings of worthlessness. They mistakenly think that decreasing self will increase Christ. Frankly, that sounds more like depression than joy. Truth be told, the focus of attention is still on ourselves, isn't it? The only hope of decreasing self is increasing Christ. Isn't that good? True humility isn't making myself less by thinking less of myself or putting myself down. Someone comes up to me afterwards, go, Bill, I, I just love that message. And I'm going, oh, it wasn't me. I'm just uh, not a good preacher. No, that's depression. True humility, true selflessness doesn't mean my self-worth has to go down into the toilet. It's not making myself lesser of a human. It's making God's greatness so much bigger. That's true humility. Which brings us to number three on your note sheet. We must see ourselves in a proper light, not in a negative light. We must see ourselves in a proper light, not a negative light. And when we see ourselves in a proper light, that's going to show us how amazing God is. And this is exactly how John replies to his disciples, his followers. We've got our territory, we've got our ministry, and now we're getting criticized and people are leaving. They're going to the church across the street or the baptisms across the river. What are we going to do? Let's take a lesson from the guy that Jesus says is the greatest in the entire Bible. This is what greatest looks like and sounds like. And John replies to the criticisms. Verse 27, to this John replied, a person can only receive what is given to them from heaven. Oh my gosh, there's so much in that one little verse that we need to unpack. A person can only receive what is given them from heaven. The very first thing John replies, you've only got what you've been given. You're being attacked. You're being criticized. Other people are treating you unfairly. Other people are getting more. Other people are moving ahead. And John's reply is exactly the, the solution that we need. When John's criticized, hey, you're doing that wrong. You're, you're not doing this the way you should. When a part of his territory is being encroached on, John's mindset is, guys, you don't understand. It's not my territory. It's not my ministry. It's not my turf. I can only receive what's been given to me. Which brings us to number four on your note sheet. Understanding that our talents, our platform, our position are simply gifts. They're simply gifts. When it comes to our talents and our platform, and when it comes to our, our resources and all the relationships in our life, when it comes to what we have, John goes, let me tell you. Let me tell you why I'm not upset about this. Let me tell you why you, sh you shouldn't be upset either. They're simply gifts. His disciples are like, ah, don't you care? We're being criticized, and now people are going someplace else. And John's like, whoa, 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 whoa. All of that? is what's been given to me. And it is God's prerogative to take from me because it was never mine. They were simply His. They're gifts. But people, where do we draw that line? Where do we determine as Christ followers when it's appropriate, when we should stand up for ourselves and defend ourselves against unfairness? And when should we remain silent? And that's a very real problem that we all struggle with. And I promise you, I am right there with you in the middle of this mess that we call life. We want to be humble servants, but our pride pushes us to defend ourselves and to stand up for what we believe is right. 
Oh, church, we've been given so much more than we deserve. And this is what you and I have got to remember. What do we deserve? The answer's got to be hell. I deserve hell. I don't deserve to be with God. I don't deserve to be loved by God. I don't deserve the 20,000 million billion trillion chances he's given me. I don't deserve the kingdom of heaven. I don't deserve the blessings I have in my life. I have rebelled against the almighty God. I deserve hell. And so anything, anything that he gives me is such a huge bonus. But it is just a gift. And if I truly believe that's true, if I truly believe that what I have comes from him, if I truly believe that I don't own it, he does, then how am I going to get jealous or prideful when it's taken from me? Next week, we're going to pick up this discussion again because there's just too much here. And I want, to, I want to talk more about this idea because John is going to explain how to do this and what real greatness looks like in real life. And so please, you've got to make sure you come back for that one. Pride can kill us. Pride can so wrap us up in anger and bitterness and the desire for revenge that we do crazy things. But it happens when we think it's ours, it's mine, it's yours. That job should have been yours. That promotion should have been yours. That pay raise should have been yours. Next week, we're going to see how John answers this question. But for today, let's close in prayer. Father God, thank you. Thank you for everything that you have given to us, even though we don't deserve it. God, you've given each of us talents and abilities and passions and possessions and, and, and positions. And God, help us to remember that it is not for our glory. It is for yours. No one is created like me. No one is created like anyone else. We all have different gifts, but they are just that. They are gifts. May we never, ever hold on to them too tightly so that we don't become prideful and think that they're ours. God, we ask for grace and humility to accept your will for us in all things and in all ways. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Thank you for being here this morning. Please come back next Sunday. But in the meantime, how do you handle it when your character is attacked? Are you defensive? Do you get angry? May I suggest your, your anger may be justified and you might have a right to be defensive. But in doing so, you may jeopardize your Christian walk. It is a very narrow path that we have to walk sometimes. And it can be difficult. Proceed with caution. Proceed prayerfully. But proceed in the light of grace, knowing that everything you have, your gifts, your talents, your position is from God. And maybe, just maybe, he's got something bigger and better for you somewhere else. This week, take some time. Find someone who's struggling with pride, with anger, with resentment. Maybe they've been hurt, maybe fairly, maybe unfairly. But talk with them. Share the love of Christ with them. And oh yes, invite them to come to church with you next Sunday. God bless you. <clears throat>